So again, we greet you in the name of the Lord. So often when we come to reading the passage, uh, following the reading of our passage, we often pray. And, um, you know, there has been a sense of awareness in that, and that as we come to deliver, impart the word of God, in our prayer, we often ask that God would touch our ears and give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and the wills and minds to obey. And I thought of that in the context of our message today. Bible says that there are many voices in the world, and none of them are without significance. And I just pray that God today will help us to tune in to what the Spirit of God would impart to us through his word. And I know that today that there are perhaps those that may join us uh, online. They may watch this on Facebook or on our YouTube channel. And I want to say today that I believe God has an intention for each of us. The title of my message today is this, Here and Your Soul Shall Live. In the book of Isaiah 55, verse number three, one verse, incline your ear and come unto me, hear and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. When De uh, Isaiah made that statement concerning the sure mercies of David, what he was actually doing, he was quoting Jehovah God and that God had promised to Israel, a future resurrection of the promises and the blessings that were designed and intended for them, and that these blessings and these promises were sure. They were certain, and we could rely upon them, and they are certainly the mercies that God was going to extend again to Israel, who so often had drifted away from the truths and the covenant that they had with God. I got uh, looking at that particular scripture in one of the other versions of the Bible that I have in my library, and of interest, I looked at my New Living Translation Bible, and the New Living Translation Bible, often, if you were to look at that, if you have one, there are many of the chapters of scripture there that are actually given a title by those that have organized uh, this scripture. And Isaiah 55 is entitled, Invitation to the Lord's Salvation. I want to read some of the verses that are there. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. If you have no money, why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does, that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love and pro I promised to David. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God and he will forgive you generously. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, so shall the word of God that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The other day while I was preparing for today's sermon and I got to reading and meditating on the things of God, I started looking at Isaiah chapter 55 and I read it from my King James Version. But as I said, I looked at it from this other translation and got to tell you that as I was reading it, it, just the presence of God began to fill my heart. And I was absolutely amazed with the wonderment of God's love for Israel. And through scripture, we realize of God's love for us today and of God's deliberate 
intention for our lives. And I want to say to somebody today, God has a design, a purpose, and a plan for your life. And I so appreciate the words of encouragement. I felt God speak into my heart through reading Isaiah chapter 55 once again. Begin thinking the other day of a trip that Sister Underwood and I had enjoyed uh, that took us through Montana for our first time and never been to the state of Montana and, you know, really didn't really understand a lot that we would see there. But we did come across some signs that were directing us really to a piece of ground and geography that is well known. And it had a sign there, the uh, location of Custard's Last Stand. And if you've read anything of American history concerning uh, this area era of time of uh, the American history, I think all of us have come acquainted with a man that very early in his years, uh, he was known as George Custard. And he was really known as really being the boy general. In fact, he went to West Point. He graduated from West Point in 1858. But if you read concerning his uh, life, you'll find that he actually graduated from West Point, the last in his class. But he was one of the most self-assured soldiers or officers within uh, the American army of his day. And really, when we look at his life, there were many accomplishments. But what we know most and best of George uh, Custer was really that of his biggest failure. He graduated, I said, in 1858, but his academic, uh, uh, I can't say his proudness, but you know, his academic uh, failure, if maybe, really didn't deter him from putting really all of his very best into serving in the American military. One of the things that was really within his favor is that he made a point of getting under the mentorship and the leadership of some very well-known generals and officers within his day. And we look at some of his military comp campaigns and really of his, uh, his Battle of Bull Run, which was really well-known, but really what really stands out in his early success is that he was really part of that military campaign uh, that really saw the uh, uh, the surrender of uh, Robert E. Lee of the, uh, the Civil War. But after the Civil War ended, he continued within the military and became very involved within uh, the army that fought against some of the First Nations or the Indian Nations. In particular, he fought against the, the Cheyenne and the Sioux Nations. And, you know, there was just something about these particular years that, you know, he kind of got caught up in his own uh, worth and his own might, so to speak. And he was known for not listening to counsel, not listening to the voices of military leaders that had preceded him. And the Bible says that there is great counsel, great wisdom within the voices of many counsels. And so against the advice of these military advisors and these commanders, he plunged into what came to be his last stand. And that was at the Battle of Little Bighorn against the Sioux and the Cheyenne nations of where he fought against um, that uh, Indian leader, Crazy Horse. And in these last, uh, last campaign, he took... 550 soldiers, and he went to war into a battle uh, that he was advised against about, uh, from about 3,500 Indian warriors. And he was so self-assured of his own prowess and his own military uh, might that he was quoted as saying, hurry up, boys, we've got them. We'll finish them off, and then we'll go home to our station. And of course, that was not to be. You know the end of the story. Him and many of his soldiers died at this uh, battleground and come to known as his last stand. And I think that we can glean a lot. There's a lot of lessons to be learned as we look into the history of those that had preceded us, 
especially historic battles. And there have been many that have studied those and they've been emplaced into the journals of military strategies and so on. But I believe that there is well within the reading of God's word, those that we can learn from, from looking at and examining their lives. And I've been sharing with some of you that I've been reading from a new study Bible that for the very first time uh, that I've read it, I've actually uh, received this from my wife some 10 years ago as a gift, and it's a chronological study Bible. And I've got, been reading from the book of First and Second Kings. That's where I am right now. And there was a man that we learn about there that was uh, really a man of great talents, but yet there was a stubborn streak within this man that we can really look at his life and an example, and we can see from the summation of his life and really the end of his life that he was a man that refused to listen to the voice of God as God sent to him men that would speak into his life. And as I was reading from 1 Kings chapters 20 to 22, which really summar summarizes uh, this man's life, we become acquainted with this man by the name of Ahab, King Ahab. And as we particularly read from 1 Kings chapter 20, we're acquainted that there is the king of Syria, man a name by the name of Ben-Hadab, that joins forces with 32 other nations, 32 other kings that rally together, and they have purpose within their hearts that they are going to war against Israel to defeat them, and so they come up to war against Samaria. But God sees the situation. He sees the evil intent of these alliances of wicked uh, nations. And even though he sees the transgressions of, of Ahab, but for his people, God sends him word that I am going to go and I am going to deliver this numerous army into your hands and you're going to defeat them. And sure enough, as you read from 1 Kings chapter 20, you see where God gives to uh, Israel a great uh, victory over all of these nations that have risen up against them. And as they begin to leave and they lick their wounds, there were those that came to ben Habadab and they said, you know, the reason we lost this was really a military strategy. You see, these Israelis, they know how to fight from the mountains. But if somehow we could get them into the plains and into the valleys, it is there where we will have a sure victory. And so they rally again and they come a second time with great threats and, you know, threats of abuse of what they're going to do to Israel and defeating them and uh, overthrowing the nation of Samaria or a nation of Israel and Samaria. So the Bible says that once again, God is going to prove whether you're going to fight God's people on the mountains or whether you're going to fight him in the valleys, God is still God, and God will bring the victory to those that place their trust in him. And so while God gave again a second victory from a second attack from all of these armies, there's something that's beginning to really take place within the heart of King Ahab, the king of Israel. And he's beginning to listen to uh, the reputation and to the rapport and the celebration that are others that are given to him, even the enemy, you know, upon their defeat of how that King Ahab is a such a wonderful king and so on. And so ben hadad says, listen, all that was taken from you, we're going to return to you. And, you know, and, and he began to praise him for his military proudness and so on. And something of pride began to really spring up within the heart of King Ahab, so that really in the end of this second battle, what he did, rather than to destroy his enemy, he made an alliance with them, even though he was told to uh, take them out, he spared the king and he spared uh, many of these others, and he made an alliance with him. But on his way home from the battle, the Bible says that there was an anonymous prophet that was sent by God really to Ahab. And it begins to tell him a story 
about how that there had been a war and that there was a prisoner of that war that escaped, but how that in the end, this prisoner actually came to be the means of the overthrow of that king. And Ahab realized, that's me he's speaking about. And in his same response to this prophet, he begins to even admit really what his own demise would be. And there are some that are scholars today that even believe that this prophet that is not named in this particular uh, scripture of 1 Kings chapter 20 was actually Micaiah, who actually confronts uh, King Ahab in, my, in 1 Kings chapter 22. And as you begin to review, really, Ahab's life, you know, the tragedy of his life is that he wasted the opportunities, really, that were provided to him in both listening to God and the opportunities of seizing the total victory that God had intended for Israel, even in these first two uh, campaigns of war. Ahab should have destroyed his enemies, but because he came to be very fond of his enemies and the way that they celebrated him and talked him up and so on, he did not follow the voice and the word of God that was given to him. And he's not the first king really to have ever done that. You know, we look at years earlier of King Saul, where he was told to destroy the Amalekites, who were a very wicked and demeaning people. And Saul, because of that, he actually lost really his life, you know, in a way of suicide in a battle. But, you know, it's not only kings and leaders that we may see within Scripture. You know, we can perhaps maybe consider those who have influenced our lives and people that maybe even within ministry or people that had served God for years that somehow through their life, they begin to listen to some wrong voices. As I said, there are many voices within this world, none of them without influence. So I want to say to us today, we need to be careful to keep our hearts in tune to the word of God through scripture, God through teaching of his word and meditating upon his word, and that we need to ask God to give us wisdom of those voices of influence that would speak to us, because there have been those within life that have listened to voices that they perhaps shouldn't have and have really lost out with the blessings and the promises of God today. And so when we have an opportunity, friends, of when God has delivered us from influences that would take us away from the things of God, be the addictions or uh, things that would corrupt the nature of God within our lives, we need to ask God to help us to put those out of our lives, to not harbor them in any area within our lives, but to utterly put them away from us, such as what King Ahab should have done. And as we consider the 22-year reign of King Ahab, we can conclude that really his life was really the tragedy, really, of wasted opportunities and not listening to the voice of God and giving himself to the fleshly carnal appetites and those choices that he made. And Ahab was a man that he really had the opportunity of listening to one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, Elijah. But you look at all the many occasions of where he was greeted and spoken to by Elijah, he never allowed Elijah to have a lasting impact upon his life. He married a godless sinner woman, you know, Jezebel, and even to please her, introduced into Israel the worship of a pagan god, Baal, and led Israel away from God. He was a king that really had such great opportunities, could have led uh, Israel into many more victories, but you know, he failed to do that even was there on Mount Carmel. He witnessed Elijah uh, call upon God that God would prove that the God that answered by fire, he would be God. And God answered by fire against those prophets of Baal. And even when the fire of God fell and those prophets of Baal were put to death, it didn't change the heart 
of Ahab because he had set that stubborn nature within him. No, I am going to have things my way, and I am not going to listen to the voice of God. And it seems today that there's still a similar spirit of Ahab, you know, that is present within the world today, alive within this generation, that even though there's the appeal of the word of God, there's the appeal from the spirit of God to the voice of ministry, the voice of people that God places within their lives, whether it be it a Christian parent or be it a Christian neighbor or a Christian friend, they have set their mind that, no, I'm going to find things out for myself. I'm enjoying what I'm doing, and I am just going to go and uh, you know live life the way that I want. My message today is here, and your soul shall live. Ahab's actions demonstrated, demonstrated that he was going to be an individual, a king, that was arming himself really against God. And these whole three chapters really portray a story who was positioning himself that he was going to fight a battle he had no business fighting, at a time when he should never have been involved with it, all because he refused to listen to the voices of those that God sent into his life to avoid these things. And that's just the way that it really is, really within natural mind. I said a few weeks ago, I remember many years ago, my pastor saying to me, he said, Jim, if you'll listen to me, if you'll learn from the things that I have experience within my life. He said, son, I can save you a world of hurt and many tears. But that's just the way that it is with many today. But all oh, I've got to experience it for myself. Again, I pray that as we listen to the word of God, God, open our ears that we might hear. God, touch our hearts that we would receive. God, give us the will and the courage to obey God, your word. And so as we come to 1 Kings chapter 22, you know, through after three years, Ahab decides, well, maybe we need to take out these nations. And he goes again against the king of Syria. But you see, it's really too late. You see, when God gave him that opportunity, he wasted that opportunity, and he really sealed his own demise. Friends, when God opens up the windows of heaven and he blesses us and he places somebody in our path in our life that will speak to us and minister to us the loving kindness, the compassion and the desire and the intentions of God, as we read from Isaiah chapter 55, my prayer is that, oh, God, let me not only receive it, but God, let me apply it in every area of my life. And so uh, the Bible says in uh, 1 Kings 22 that the king of Israel, Ahab, joins forces with the king of uh, Judah, uh, Jehoshaphat, and he asks him to come and join an alliance with him to go against uh, to war against these heathen nations. And Jehoshaphat joins him. And while they're there, Ahab calls for the prophets, many prophets. The Bible says there was 400 of them. And if you read on there, you'll see that there is an account that Micaiah actually saw that God gave to him of where that God looked for who would go and speak to Ahab that you know, would uh, get him to go and fight this battle. And the Bible says that there was one that said, I'll come and I'll be a lying spirit to him. And I'll convince uh, Micaiah or Ahab because of his wickedness and his refusal to hear. The Bible says that these 400 prophets came to these two kings, Ahab and Jehoshaphat. And they said, oh, God has told us to send uh, your armies against uh, Behenadad into this battle, and God is going to give you great victory, and you're going to have a great celebration of all that God is going to do for you. But you see, there was something within Jehoshaphat's life that was in tune with God that didn't set right with him. 
the Bible says in 1 Kings 22, he said, then the king of Israel, um, no, I'm sorry, Jehoshaphat, he said, is there not yet a prophet? And so the Bible says that Ahab says, yes, there, there is still another prophet. And in 1 Kings 22 and 8, he said, the king of Israel being Ahab said unto Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Emma, by whom we may inquire the Lord. But I hate him. I despise him, for he doth not prophesy good things concerning me, but evil. You see, Micaiah has had several uh, previous encounters with Ahab, and he knew that Ahab was not one that was in tune to listening to the voice of God. And so there was that uh, experience that Ahab had with him that he learned to hate him and to despise him. And so Micaiah has visitors from the, um, the, the throne room of uh, Ahab, and they come and they said, now listen, these other prophets came and they told Ahab and Jehoshaphat that they were to go to battle. And we think it'd be a good thing that if you support that and you go and, you know, be in alignment uh, to what they had said. Micaiah said, listen, what God gives me, that is what I'm going to say. But when Micaiah comes to uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat, kind of plays a game. He said, oh, yeah, Ahab, God said you're going to go and you should go and, you know, go there and defeat them. And he's going to give you a great victory and, you know, go into battle and, you know, it's yours and, and so on and so on. But then something, you know, within perhaps maybe the way that Micaiah had said this to him, uh, Ahab said to uh, Micaiah, he said, haven't I told you before that when you come to me and you speak, you speak the things that are true? And that was just the invitation that Micaiah needed. He said, yes, you have. And here's what God has showed me. God showed me, he said, that I see that Israel is like sheep without a shepherd, and they're going to be scattered. Ahab, you got no business going into this battle. This is a battle you cannot win. You're going to die within this battle. And Ahab, you need to listen, listen, and hear, and your soul can live. But if you are going to reject the word and the counsel of God, be it known to you that there is going to be a great defeat. So Ahab, you know, when he could have listened to that message, he rejects that message, and there are some chilling consequences. He becomes literally, again, a man that's determined, I'm going to arm myself against the counsel of God. And friend, when you arm yourself against and you make up your mind that you're not going to listen to those opportunities and to those voices and to the word of God that God will present within our lives, we are positioning ourselves for consequences Amen, that we do not want to have. And so he rejects the message. First Kings 22 and 18. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you he would prophesy no good things concerning me, but evil. Micaiah warned him, this is not a battle for you. This is not a fight that you can win. And so Ahab demonstrates the supreme and the intense hatred that he has for this prophet man of God, that he says that he puts him into prison. You know, friends, the true authentic message stung his heart, but this spiritual inquiry that he had causes him to hate this prophet. And how very similar it is to really Paul's writing to Timothy. You know, he said, preach the word, Timothy. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. He said, Timothy, the time will come when those hearers will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears and shall turn away from the truth and turn themselves onto fables. Friends, it's the same thing today as it was within Micaiah's day. When the word of truth goes forth, 
if the hearer of those words have determined within their heart that they're not going to receive and reject the word of God, not only do they reject the word of God, but they will also become you know, despised, really, to uh, he, they will actually despise, I'm sorry, those that bring the word of God to them. Alexander McLaren, he was an old Scottish uh, Baptist minister in the 1800s. He said, the truth which a man or a generation requires the most is the truth which he least likes. Think about that. How many of you are familiar with Buckley's cough medicine? When we were young, raise your hand now if you, if you have, you know. And what was the things they advertised? There was a strange advertisement when you think about it. The advertisement today wants to make everything so sweet. And so enjoyable and everything else. But with Buckley's, there was something about that. When you got the cold or the flu, they said it tastes awful, but it works. It works. Amen. Years ago, there was a sailor, and he was about to go onto a whaling expedition. And, you know, he knew he was going to be out on the ocean for some time. And so he came to those in that port there that he was in. And he said, listen, could you tell me where there's a church that I might go and hear a good sermon? And so they directed him to a church down the, uh, the other side of town. And he went down and listened to that sermon. And when they came back, they said, hey, listen, how was it? How was that experience? How was that sermon? He said, well, you know, he said, really, I, I, I've got to tell you, I, I really didn't like it too much. You know, that church was, you know, it was like a church that was leaving for whaling. It was a great church. Everything was in order. There was plenty of supplies. It was a great experienced crew. And I had all the roofs and uh, there were all the ropes and the sails were set just, you know, they were trimmed and ready to go and all that. But I didn't find any harpoons. There was no harpoons. You know, I remember years ago, one of our members said, Pastor, don't sugarcoat it. Preach it to me just the way that it is. You know, that doesn't mean we can abuse or take our liberty. Amen. We need to preach and present the word of God as it is, but with, with compassion and mercy and love that God has presented it. But I want you to know, friends, there's something to be honored within our heart that says, oh, God, if you see anything within me, God, show me the error of my way. Help me, Lord, to be more like you. Praise God. You know, there have been many old preachers and evangelists that we've heard about, one by the name of Billy Sunday, you know, that, you know, was quite a preacher. They tell me that when he used to minister in these large evangelistic campaigns, that people actually, their knuckles became white because of the intensity in which they held on to their seat. Why? Because there was something in the anointed preaching of God. Praise God. Charles Spurgeon, a famous London preacher, kind of summed these thoughts up like this. He said, what would you think of a man who has fallen overboard from a ship and is drowning? And the sailors throw him a rope, but he refuses to grab onto the rope. He says, I don't like that rope. That rope has got tar on it. Don't you know who I am? Don't send me a dirty rope. And I don't like the ones that manufactured that rope. And I saw who threw me that rope, and I've got an issue with that man. I, I'm not, you know, going to take anything that he sends me. Unfortunately, the man drowns. The sailors bring that dead body ashore, and they look at him. They said, you know, we tried, and he deserves what he got. He wouldn't listen. It served him right. Here Ahab, he takes Micaiah. The Bible says he locks him up. Take Micaiah and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the Lord, put this fella in prison and feed him with bread of affliction. In other words, torture him and with water of affliction until I come again. The message that Ahab received from this man of God so inflamed him, he delivered him back for torture and to put him in prison. Listen to what Micaiah said. Ahab, you don't get it. You're not coming back. Ahab, you're going to die within this battle. You're not coming back. You can't win this battle. 
1 Kings 22 and 28, if thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. He would say, look, if you come back, then I'm a false prophet. I never heard from God. As I was reading that, I thought of someone that was very dear to me. And very early in my experience with God, wanting to share, and I would talk about things of the word of God. And I, yeah, I, like many new converts, I talked a lot about hell and judgment and all that kind of stuff. And this person said to me, James, you know, you know, you can't be sure that you're right. You know, because if you were right, there would have been somebody that died, went to hell and would have come back and told us about it. And I said, you don't understand. When you die and if you go to hell, you don't come back. There's something so profound about that. It's one thing to reject the message. And then it's another thing when you reject those that God places within your life, be it a preacher, be it a parent, be it a friend, be it a colleague that wants to share the word of God. The Bible says, do my prophets no harm. But Ahab took the path that many that reject the word of God take when they reject the word of God. He not only sees Here's what really God is saying to him, but he sees that spokesperson. And we've seen that all throughout history. There have been more than one church, more than one minister, more than one Christian that has been completely rejected from list of the people that, that would listen to praise God. And I would dare say there have been many times within my life that I've rejected that. You know, I can still remember sometimes when the preacher the pastor was preaching the word of God. And I like to get myself behind one of the biggest, largest people within the congregation. And I like to just sit just so behind them that hid me from the pulpit. And there were times that I would, you know, when the word of God was getting to me, I would reach down and begin to tie my shoelaces or pretend to tie it because I didn't want that preacher zeroing in on me. Why? Because I knew with what they were saying, that was God speaking to my heart, speaking to my life. Put them in prison. Go ahead. Shut up the conscience in the dark dungeon. Stuff a gag in his mouth so I can't hear him. Close off your own ears. So in this last battle, Ahab disguises himself. Told Jehoshaphat, you go dress like a king, but I'm going to go dress like one of the soldiers. And what he was doing was demonstrating his own hypocrisy. You see, he was the king of Israel. He had many privileges. He had many opportunities, but he wasted them. And while he was a king, he just arrayed himself just as a simple soldier. He was thinking one direction, but he's living in another, condemning others while he refused to look at his own self and the things that he needed to pay attention to and say, is there any way that I can measure myself to make sure I'm not thinking along those same lines? And in Ephesians 4, verse 17, he said, Wherefore, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of God is. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak into yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord giving thanks always for all things are of God, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, having not spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We, listen, we are the members of the body. It's we that he is speaking to. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Friends, that's how we can measure our spirit, by comparing our life to what is given to us through the word and the voice of the anointed word of God. Amen. Ahab went into battle. And it's interesting, as you read that last battle, disguised as a soldier, the Bible says there was a, an unnamed soldier of, of the enemy's encampment, just took his bow and 
just ventured a shot. What he was saying is that he wasn't aiming at Ahab. He was just shooting a bow, shooting an arrow, hoping that it might hit some of the enemy and so on. But that arrow found its mark, according as Micaiah said it would happen. And it wounded Ahab to the point they took him off the battlefield. And he died in his chariot. His blood flowed to the ground. And the animals licked up his blood. Ahab, why didn't you listen? Here in your soul could have lived. You didn't have to die that way. Why make those choices? In this day when the word of God is going out in so many other avenues, you know, people perhaps are not comfortable with going to a church. Maybe they're more comfortable with listening it online through things like this. What I'm saying to you, that God is allowing the church today to take advantage of various opportunities to bring the word of God into the heart of men and women that he loves. I'm not preaching condemnation to you today. I'm preaching hope here that your soul may live. Read Isaiah chapter 55. I'm coming to an end. Let me sum it up this way. Ahab, you had no business going into that battle. You had no business being on that battleground. But because you rejected the voice of God, you rejected his counsels, you rejected and you would not hear, and you continued with your own stubborn obstinance against the things of God. You are like the soldier that went out and you stripped yourself, stripped yourself of every armament that God provides in Ephesians chapter 6. Paul said, put on the whole armor of God that you might withstand the enemy. He talks about the helmet of salvation. It was God. The breastplate of righteousness. Ahab, it's God. The belt of truth the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit. Ahab, you went out with your fist to fight against those that had tanks. You were going to lose. Amen. People that reject the word of God are in danger of putting themselves in the same situation. Today, as we come to an end, in the conclusion of this, I listened to another song the other day. It came across on my computer, and it's by a group called Casting Crowns. Maybe some of you are aware of it. But there was a song, a beautiful song written by John Mark Hall and Bernie Hams, and it was entitled, If Ever I Needed You, It's Now. And I'm going to invite you right now to bow your heads and close your eyes and, and to listen to the words of this song, the lyrics as I make them our prayer today. Hear our cry, Lord, we pray. Our faces down, our hands are raised. You called us out, we turned away. We turned away. With shipwrecked faith, the idols rise. We do what is right in our own eyes. Our children now will pay the price. We need your light, Lord, send your light. If ever we needed you, Lord, it's now. Lord, it's now. We are desperate for your hand. We're reaching out. We're reaching out. All our hearts, our strength, with all our minds, we're at your feet. May your kingdom come in our hearts and lives. Let your church arise. Let your church arise. We need you now. Revive us now. We need you now. Praise God. Father, today, I pray for each and every one that is listening in to this broadcast today, that, Lord, you would ask us and you would compel us and inspire us, God, to open our ears and to live here, God, today, your word. God, to receive in our hearts the anointed word of God and the wills and minds to obey. I pray for each and every one today that the Spirit of God would reach and touch them. Lord, we know that it's not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit. That's how, God, you will lead people today. It's by your Spirit. 
I pray, God, today, help us, Lord, to give you our very best and our very all. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen.